Welcome to Unit 9, Axis and Dominance. Here we go. So, right click on your Unit 9 test and open the link in a new window. Get your test started. Resize your window so that you can see your test. Perfect. And then go back to your original window and click on the unit introduction for emphasis and dominance. And size that window down so that you can see both your test window and the online textbook. Unit introduction, emphasis and dominance. Okay, before we do that, we have to read all of our questions. Number one, what is emphasis? Removing the contrast from an artwork, subordinating an artwork to the other artwork around it, disrupting the balance of an artwork with counterpoint techniques such as direction lines, making certain parts of an artwork stand out compared to the other parts of an artwork. Question two, Edgar Degas was famous for paintings of blank. His family members, military scenes, British scientists, artists, writers, and politicians, or dancers and horses. Question three. What is the word for de-emphasizing parts of an artwork so the emphasized parts will stand out more? Dominance, illumination, counterpoint, or subordination? Question four. Which of the following artists was a famous 17th century Dutch painter and printmaker? Edgar Degas, Odilon Rudden, Rembrandt van Rijn, or Julia Margaret Cameron. Question five. If many different implied lines are pointed to the same object of an artwork, that object has blank. Emphasis, symmetry, contrast, or counterpoint? Question six. In a, if a paint, in a painting that uses mostly light colors, what could be used to create emphasis? Dark colors, smooth textures, rough textures, or analogous colors? Question seven. Which of the following artists helped to promote photography as a fine art to place it among the other arts such as painting, poetry, and sculpture? Julia Margaret Cameron, Maya Yin Lane, Georgia O'Keeffe, or Rosa Bonheur? Question 8. Counterpoint is a way to add emphasis through the arrangement of blank art elements. Contrasting, subordinate, textural, or directional? Question 9. Which famous work of art is Maya Ying Lin known for? The Vietnam Veterans Memorial, the Lincoln Memorial, the Statue of Liberty, or the Washington Monument? And question 10. Although many people consider Edgar Degas to be one of the founders of Impressionism, what did he consider himself to be? A symbolist, a fauvist, a realist, or a futurist? Great, let's see if we can find the answers to those questions. In this section, you'll learn about different kinds of emphasis and dominance, learn about how different artists used emphasis and dominance in art. And then later for the project, we'll trace bitmap images and then clone them and use what we've learned to create emphasis using color, shape, and size. We'll export individual layers as separate bitmap images. Lesson introduction. In the lesson, Emphasis and Dominance Overview, you'll learn about emphasis and dominance and how they're used in different types of artworks and designs. Emphasis is making certain parts of an artwork stand out compared to other parts of an artwork. Emphasis is related to movement because they both encourage the viewer's eyes to look at an artwork in a specific way. But where movement is concerned with how the eyes move, emphasis is concerned with where the eyes move. Dominance is when one part of an artwork has far more emphasis than another part of an artwork. Subordination is the name for de-emphasizing parts of an artwork, so that the emphasized parts will stand out more. Let us learn more about specific techniques for creating emphasis and dominance in an artwork. And I know that this was one of our questions. So, what is the word for de-emphasizing parts of an artwork so that the emphasized parts will stand out more? Subordination. Color. The use of color can be an easy way to create emphasis. For example, in a painting with mostly light colors, an artist might use dark colors for the emphasis. The contrast between the light and dark colors creates the emphasis. So I know that was one of our questions.
In a painting with mostly light colors, this is question six, what could be used to create emphasis? Dark colors, so be thinking like opposites. Alternatively, in a painting with mostly dark colors, an artist might use light colors for emphasis in the same way that a spotlight points at a singer on a stage. More subtly, an artist might create emphasis by using minor value changes with strong hue changes. For example, in a painting of flowers in the middle of an all green field, the different colors of the flowers would create emphasis. Color can also be used in increasing complex ways to create emphasis. For example, in a painting with mostly analogous colors, and analogous colors are colors that are side by side on the color wheel, an artist might paint an object in colors that contrast strongly with those analogous colors. Another complex example of emphasis could be a large block of a dark color surrounded by lighter colors. The dark color would have dominance. Similarly, a large block of a light color surrounded by darker colors would create dominance. Texture is another way to create emphasis. In an artwork, emphasis can be created through contrasting areas of smooth and rough textures. Texture emphasis is like texture contrast, but emphasis is more about what an artist chooses to emphasize using texture than the differences between the textures in an artwork. The smooth and rough textures can either be physical or visual, depending on the artistic medium an artist is working in. In an artwork that uses a mostly smooth texture, an artist might create emphasis by adding areas of rough physical or visual texture in the artwork. So physical texture would be you'd actually touch it with your fingers and it would feel rough. But visual texture means that it would look a certain way like wallpaper does, but when you touch it, it would feel smooth. Alternate, alternatively, if an artwork has a mostly rough texture, an artist could, an, could add an area with a smooth texture to create emphasis. So look at the visual texture. This is visually soft. Shape. There are many ways that shape can be used to create emphasis and dominance. A common way to create emphasis with shape is when an artist uses similar actual or implied line shapes sorry, throughout an artwork and then adds a small number of different shapes. For example, in an artwork full of circular shapes, adding a square would emphasize that part of the artwork. Even an implied shape can add emphasis to an artwork. A group of smaller shapes can be arranged to form one giant implied shape which would most likely emphasize the large implied shape over the smaller shapes. Groups of implied or actual shapes can be bent or arranged so that they all point toward a single point of focus or area of emphasis. Space is a powerful tool for creating emphasis and dominance in an artwork. An artist can create emphasis simply by adding space around the object being emphasized. For example, in a painting of a lighthouse on the coast, an artist could use the sea and the sky to create a lot of empty space around the lighthouse. This empty space would emphasize the lighthouse or even give it dominance in the painting. Alternatively, grouping several objects together by reducing the space between them can emphasize the group and even give it dominance in the artwork. For example, in a painting of a flock of birds flying together, the group of birds would have more emphasis than if each bird were scattered evenly throughout the painting. Size. The larger something is, the more attention it tends to get. One way to emphasize something in an artwork is to make it bigger. For example, a lone mountain peak on the horizon will dominate the landscape around it. In non-realistic paintings, artists often use differences in size not only to create emphasis between objects, but to emphasize specific parts of an object. For example, an artist might emphasize a person's hands by making them much larger than they would be in a realistic artwork. Lines. There are many ways to use lines to create emphasis and dominance. Taking advantage of the way lines can be used to create movement, an artist can draw lines so that they lead the way to what the artist wants to emphasize. In an extreme example, several lines with arrows all pointing inward and a single point would create dominance for that point. And I believe that that was one of our questions. Uh, 
If many different implied lines are pointing to the same object in an artwork, that would be, mm -mm -mm. well, I want to say emphasis. <laughs> but let's find out because I might be wrong. All right. Groups of lines can also create implied shapes around an object in order to create emphasis. For example, when drawing the sun, children often draw lines moving outward from the sun, which helps to emphasize it. The lines increase emphasis by making the sun's implied shape larger and also by creating lines of movement that point toward the sun. So that was it. If many implied lines are pointing in the same object of an artwork, it's called emphasis. Very good. Let's do this checkpoint. In the following image, choose the most emphasized or dominant area. Hmm, what do you think? I know what I think it is. I'm not gonna say anything because I think you're smart enough to get this one on your own. Question two, in the following image, choose the most emphasized or dominant area. Hmm, what is the most emphasized? Talked about this, we talked about this. Where are all of the, the actual and implied lines pointing? Where are they all pointing? Finally, question three. In the following image, choose the most emphasized or dominant area. Oh, that one's easy. You know which one that is. Counterpoint is a way to add emphasis through the arrangement of contrasting art elements. Counterpoint can also be used to create balance, but counterpointed elements aren't always in balance. Let us learn more about counterpoint. I know we have a question about counterpoint, don't we? Counterpoint is a way to add emphasis through the arrangement of contrasting art elements. Good, that was question number eight. Direction lines. Lines moving in opposite directions are often in counterpoint. A vertical line contrasted with a horizontal line would be in counterpoint, and they would emphasize both the vertical and horizontal directions as well as the space between them. Lines that are in counterpoint can either be actual or implied. Color contrasts. Strongly contrasting colors such as complementary colors are another way to use counterpoint in an artwork. For example, blue and yellow would have a strong counterpoint if used together in the same artwork. The contrast between the blue and the yellow would emphasize each color more strongly. Value contrasts. In addition to colors, strongly contrasting values can be used to create counterpoint. For example, white and black would create a strong counterpoint in an artwork made up of shades of gray. Uh-oh, checkpoint. What art element has the strongest counterpoint in the image? Mm, so we're looking at what element contrasts the most. Would you use texture, color, shapes, or lines? Where do you see the most contrast? The first thing I noticed when I looked at this was that diagonal line. And so for me, that that was my clue that yes, it is this diagonal, these vertical and horizontal lines that are in counterpoint with one another lines. Artists use emphasis and dominance to draw attention to the most important parts of their artwork. Let us learn more about specific artists and their uses of emphasis and dominance. Julia Margaret Cameron was a 19th century photographer whose short photography career started at the age of 48, years after receiving a camera as a gift from her daughter. 
At a time when most photographers worked inside special studio workshops, Cameron photographed and developed film in her own home. Cameron took photographs of her family as well as prominent friends and acquaintances, which included many British scientists, artists, writers, and politicians. Her goal as an artist was to promote photography as a fine art, to place it among the other fine arts such as painting, poetry, and sculpture. And that was one of our questions. So let's see if we can find... Dun, 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 dun. Edgar Degas. Mm -mm -mm. Which of the following artists helped to promote photography as a fine art to place it among the other arts, such as painting, poetry, and sculpture? Julia Margaret Cameron. In her photographic portrait of Anne Philpott, which Cameron called Annie, my first success, Cameron uses contrasting values to create emphasis. Annie's face is located at the center of the photograph at the implied line where the light and dark of the background meet. In contrast with the background, which is lighter on the left than it is on the right, light is shining onto Annie's face from above and from the right side of the photograph. At the bottom of the photograph, the single round button breaks up the otherwise uninterrupted blackness while providing a nice contrast that anchors the bottom of the photograph. Edgar Degas is a 19th and 20th century painter, sculptor, and printmaker considered to be one of the founders of Impressionism, even though he rejected that description. Degas considered himself a realist painter and his works include detailed depictions of contemporary clothing, hairstyles, and other details specific to France in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So let's see here, I know that we had a similar question. Which of the following was a 17th century Dutch painter? Nope, not Degas. Edgar Degas was famous for paintings of, oh, we haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> Let's see, I know there's a one up there, oh boy. Although many people considered Edgar Degas to be one of the founders of Impressionism, what did he consider himself to be? A realist. Yes. Degas was famous for his paintings of dancers and horses, but painted a wide range of other subjects as well. All right, Edgar Degas was famous for his paintings of dancers and horses. In his painting, Der Star de Ballet, the star of the ballet, Degas uses space, size, and color to emphasize the dancer in the lower right corner of the painting. The dancer's pink color contrasts strongly with the dark browns and greens of the stage and backdrop. The dancer is much larger than the other dancers in the upper left who almost fade into the background. The large space around the dancer as well as the space taken up by her wide stance, costume, and the large bouquet she holds all emphasize the dancer and her place in the painting. Degas coordinated his use of emphasis to allow the dancer, the star of the ballet, to dominate the painting. Maya Ying Lin is a contemporary artist and architect specializing in sculpture and landscape art. She designed and created her most famous work when she was only 21 years old. In 1981, while still an undergraduate student at Yale, Lin won a public design competition for the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. Her design was chosen out of 1,421 designs submitted. Her design was for an angular black granite wall inscribed with the names of all the U.S. service members who died or went missing during the Vietnam War. One end of the Vietnam Memorial points toward the Washington Monument, while the other end points toward the Lincoln Memorial. The wall is carved into the landscape around it as a rift in the earth. 
as Maya Lin wrote in her original design submission. The memorial stands in contrast to the white vertical Washington Monument, as well as to the trees and the gently sloping grass-covered landscape that surrounds it. The size, shape, and details of the monument or memorial serve to emphasize the seriousness of its purpose, as well as the way in which it dominates the space of those who walk through it. The example image is of Lynn's original design submission, a single page summary and some architectural drawings. Ah, very nice. I know that was a question, so let's try to find that one. <laughs> Only 10 questions, but it takes forever to find them. Which famous work of art is Maya Ying Lin known for? The Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Rembrandt Van Ring, commonly referred to as Rembrandt, was a 17th century Dutch painter and printmaker. He is considered to be one of the greatest European painters and the most important Dutch painter. The misnamed painting Nachwacht or The Night Watch, was so dirty and dim when it was discovered in the 18th century that it was thought to be a night scene. When the painting was cleaned up in the 1940s, it was revealed that the painting was of a militia company stepping from a shadowy hall into sunlight. Instead of the formal portraiture that was common in the time, Rembrandt's commissioned portrait is of an action scene with the militia members preparing to embark. Rembrandt uses value, lines, and space to emphasize the captain of the company at front and center. The light that illuminates the captain helps to emphasize him almost like a spotlight would. The lightly colored clothes of his companion at the front also draw attention to the center of the painting. The painting is full of implied lines which point in toward the center of the painting and the captain. These create subtler points of focus which reinforce the emphasis on the captain. For example, the man with the yellow hat at the front contrasts strongly with the other men around him, but he is turned toward the captain giving all his attention to him. The small girl with the chicken at her belt is also in yellow and provides a counterpoint to the man in yellow. She is also looking directly at the captain. Despite the disorganized chaos of the militia gearing up for action, Rembrandt is firmly in control of his composition, creating a dominant position for the captain with his company. And I know that that was one of the questions. <laughs> Let's answer this first one. What is emphasis? Is it removing the contrast from an artwork? Is it subordinating an artwork to the other artworks around it? Is it disrupting the balance of an artwork with counterpoint techniques? Or is it making certain parts of an artwork stand out compared to the other parts. That's exactly what it is. Good job. All right, where was it? Which of the following artists was a famous 17th century Dutch painter and printmaker? That was Rembrandt. Woo! Wow, did we get them all answered? I think we might have. Oh, didn't do that one. Yep. So we got them all answered. Let's see what else is left. I think there might be, whoops, one more checkpoint. So here we go. Based on the artwork you've seen in this lesson, who made this artwork? Hmm, who was that? Who was that that painted horses and ballerinas? Edgar Degas. Nice job. 